Hi, I'm Daniel Roberts, and you are listening to the Giving Town Podcast, where we share stories of hope and generosity in our wonderful community of Newburgh, Oregon, and the surrounding area. This podcast is sponsored by my real estate team, the Joyful Roberts Group, and one of the main reasons I do this podcast is because I sincerely love this town, this community, and I love helping people move here. So if you know someone who wants to move here and needs help doing that, feel free to reach out to me directly, and I'd be more than happy to help. So in today's episode, I'm talking to Olympian Carrie Bates as she shares her story. There were so many great things to cover that we had to turn this into a two-part episode. So this will be part one as Carrie shares her story of what it was like growing up in an alcoholic family, her her journey to becoming an Olympian, and she also talks about many of the struggles with alcoholism and addiction in general. And then next week, we'll be covering part two. Carrie is such a wonderful woman and has a very powerful story, so I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Well, I have a special treat for you all today. I have Olympian Carrie Bates here, who is going to share her story, uh, her past with addiction, her past as being an Olympian. And I heard the story previously when she came and spoke at our our Rotary Club um, a little while back, and I, I mostly just want her to share her story today, but I'll be asking some questions in between. Um, but you guys are in for a treat today. So thank you so much, Carrie, for joining me. I'm really excited uh, to get your story out to all of our listeners. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's always an honor for me to be able to sit down and share some of my some of my journey and hopefully offer some insight and hope, too, when it comes to addiction and recovery. You know, my journey started um, many years ago. Um in 1984, I was at 16 years old. I was really blessed to win three Olympic gold medals in Los Angeles in the sport of swimming. And, you know, um, to the outside, it looked like I was living the perfect life, right? I was an accomplished athlete, um, going away to school on a full scholarship and, and, you know, really my life was really just beginning to take off. But, you know, we were hiding a little secret in, um, in my house, which is that I was also growing up in an alcoholic home. And, you know, what I didn't realize then is what that really meant for my future. You know, I was a young kid. I didn't really understand addiction. And I didn't understand that I, too, um, potentially had the, um, the genetic predisposition to also suffer from this illness. And so, you know, the alcoholism in my house as a kid really, you know, posed a lot of challenges. But, um, you know, I went away to school and I really didn't feel like I drank any differently than any of my peers. Um, Mm -hmm. I've thought about that a lot, actually, in my sobriety to wonder, you know, there's always that question of when did you cross that proverbial line? And, um, And I don't really know the answer to that for me. And I'm not sure it really matters because I ended up where I ended up no matter when I would have crossed that line. So, um, you know, I, I really went on with my life after the Olympics um, as a celebrated athlete. You know, I, I always say I was so blessed to be someone that really has gotten to see the world from a vantage point that very few people ever get to see. But I also, unfortunately, have seen um, the darkest parts of Earth yeah. And what it's like in this life to live in a really, really dark space. And, um, you know, but that's what brings me here today, right? Um, yeah. Is that full circle moment where I can really use my platform as an Olympic champion to yeah. really start breaking down some of the stigma of addiction. Um, in particular for women, um, there's a little more stigma. But, um, you know, so my journey has been a tough one. Yeah. So share as a child growing up in an alcoholic home. What was that like? Yeah. You know, growing up in an alcoholic home is scary for kids. Um, at least I can, those are, that's a word I would use for my experience. Um, I was always afraid. I was always unsettled. Um, I always felt unsure. And it made me um, really struggle with finding who I was because I really never had firm footing at home. Mm. I had one parent that was not um, an alcoholic but that parent traveled all the time for business. So they weren't really there a lot. And then my other parent was the one that struggled with alcoholism so severely. You know, I remember leaving for swim practice at night and I would, I would beg uh, my mom to not drink until I got home. Um, and then I would, and then I would beg cause that didn't work. And then I would beg to just maybe, can you just have like one before I got home? Mm-hmm. You know, I was really trying to negotiate with the disease, which is super interesting because as my own disease came on later in life, 
I did the same negotiations with my own disease that I used to do with my mom. Yeah. And not understanding that she was truly sick. Yeah. Like I, I thought my mother loved alcohol more than she loved me. Which I think is a really important point that doesn't seem to get talked about. Even just that terminology of using disease. I can imagine some people are listening to it and say, well, it's not a disease. They're just, yeah. you know, they're just addicts and, you know, they can't, you know, they don't have morally no weak. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So can you, I'm, whether you want to elaborate now or down the road, I think yeah. just think that's, I know some people are going to be thinking that and it's mm-hmm. an important thing to recognize that it's, um, it's not, I think there are a lot of misconceptions. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, sure. So, so yeah, continue. So you yeah, would so, negotiate with her. So I would negotiate with her because I was afraid because I, when I would come home from my practices at night, you know, she would be intoxicated and that left me feeling really lonely. Hmm. You know, addiction is really isolating and it's very, very lonely. Even if you're living in a house with an alcoholic or a drug addict, it's very isolating, not just for the addict themselves, but for the family members that are in the, in the, that family cycle and that family circle dealing with the alcoholism or the addiction, because really what happens is the, is the addiction becomes the center point of the family. Hmm. And then everything kind of revolves around that, the secrecy, no friends over. Right. We don't talk about it outside the house, which perpetuates the shame and the guilt yeah. and the stigma of it, right? Mm-hmm. And so that was very much present. All of those things were very much present for me as a as a child and into into adulthood. So then progressing through childhood, you got to a point where um you know, to share how that kind of led to then your swimming career. Yeah, you know, for me um, I was probably at a crossroads, which many kids get to when they're, um, a child of an alcoholic or an addict. And that was, you know, I could turn right and do whatever I felt like and do drugs and start drinking and doing all those things. Or, um, I could really stick with this sport that I was starting to feel some success with. I was young. Um, I happened to be pretty good at it and I also loved it. You know, that was really my, my family away from my home and, Um, It's a place where I felt very safe. I felt loved. I felt successful. And, um, and it's really where I would go and work out all of my, my anger and my sadness and my fear. You know, I, I've always said you couldn't see me cry underwater. And, um, and I did a lot of that as a kid. Do you feel like some of that pain drove your success to a degree? I do. I do. I do think that that pain and that need to, um, to be successful and that need to um, maybe make them um, proud of me, you know, all really, because that was the most positive part of my relationship with my mom was my swimming because she was very proud of me. My mom was a good mom. She was just a sick mom. Yeah. And so um, because of her own sickness, it was hard for her to get close to me in other ways, but she was super proud of my swimming accomplishments. Do you feel like there is, I mean, maybe it's even hard to tell, but I mean, you mentioned just a minute ago, you felt like she loved alcohol more than you. Mm -hmm. And that part of your swimming was in an attempt to gain her love. Do you feel Mm -hmm. like there's a part of you that felt if I'm successful enough at swimming, then maybe that would help her? Sure. I mean, I definitely felt mm-hmm. that growing up in the house with addiction, um, not, not <laughs> understanding it. Right. I didn't yeah. understand yeah. that it wasn't love is not enough. Hmm. It's just not enough to stop the cycle of this, um, of addiction, of the disease of, of addiction. Um, you know, this is what I call the great, you know, equal opportunity destroyer. Hmm. You know, it doesn't, it it literally will destroy every relationship and everything in its path, you know, because there's only one real goal of addiction and that's death. Right. Mm. So anybody that stands in the way of that or stands in the way of the progression, the disease silently takes that away from us to, to move us more and more into isolation. What an insidious thing too. I mean, even describing it that way, there's one goal of death, which is death and love are very (laughs) opposed to love. I mean, that's 
So I couldn't, yeah. I, she couldn't love me enough to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. Just like I couldn't love it out of her to make her stop drinking. Yeah. It's, it's just so much bigger than that. And yeah. then, you know, later in life, I experienced that with my own family, my own children. And yeah. So coming back to your, so you found swimming as being a great outlet. You were really good at it mm -hmm. and continued to, to progress. So then what yeah. happened from there? So, you know, when I was 15 years old, my coach sat me down and said, you know, you have a real, a real a chance of making the Olympic team next year. And I, I mean, I was I knew I was good, but I, you know, I had dreamt of being an, an Olympian, you know, my whole life. And I had all the posters in my rooms and all the things and, um, no different than any kid that aspires to a dream like that. And, um, when he told me it was really a reality, that's when, um, things got real, right. Mm -hmm. And where the training plans got real and the real goal, it wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't a, a dream anymore. It became, it went from a dream to a goal. Yeah. And there's a difference there. And so my whole life revolved around making that team. Mm -hmm. And once I made it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. I yeah. never thought I would win a gold medal, let alone yeah. three of them. Yeah. So from there, so then you went on to, to compete. And mm -hmm. can you describe that experience of, of competing in those times that you, you know, experienced that? those wins yeah um the i swam the 100 meter freestyle and it was the first day first event of the whole olympics oh wow and um we were um we were uh, another american and i nancy hogshead were um we tied for the gold in the 100 meter freestyle and that was the first tie ever recorded in olympic history there has been some since then but that was the first tie in in olympic history wow. so it was Do you the remember the time 55 92 55. So they only went to the hundreds. Only went to the hundreds, okay. not the thousand. So <laughs> like, I bet about that time they said, we need some more accurate equipment. They still don't go down to the thousand. Okay. So that hasn't changed. Okay. But, um, so yeah, it was the first time wow. two swimmers were ever awarded a gold wow. medal for the same event. So that was history making yeah. and so exciting. You know, I was a young kid and we were whisked off to the today show and all these amazing things, you know, it's just like what you would imagine yeah. it would be. Yeah. And, and most people think of, wow, that's like the pinnacle of, of human experience. And once you do that, you've got it made. And, um, but that obviously that wasn't the end of the story, but how did it feel like when you got out of the water and found out that you got that time, or maybe it was later that you found out you'd actually gotten the, the gold medal. Yeah. How did you feel at that point? Oh, I mean, Gosh, I mean, how do you put uh, <laughs> that feeling into work? I mean, elation. Yeah. I felt so proud to be an American, to stand on that award stand and watch, you know, play the national anthem and sing it. And my whole family was in the stands. Um, you know, it was it was truly at that point, it was the greatest thing that had ever happened to me. Yeah. You know, I just, I didn't know that it would become a blessing and a curse for me in my life hmm. until much later. So what happened at that point? You won, you had all the, you know, all of the celebration, mm -hmm. everything surrounding that. What happened from there? Well, I went home, you know, after the Olympics were over. I mean, we went on a tour of the United States, the medal winners and a guest, and that was really surreal. And, um, and then I went home and started high school again. I mean, it was, <laughs> I started my yeah. junior year in high school. And, um, and it wasn't easy, you know, it wasn't easy going back and, you know, navigating through who my real friends were mm -hmm. and who wanted to spend time with me because I was, you know, quote famous. Yeah. And, um, you know, so there was, there was some of the beginnings of the other side of the coin mm -hmm. that comes with being uh, somebody, a public yeah. figure, being somebody that's in the media. Yeah. And, and can you share that experience? Because a lot of young people, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and even, you know, college people have this idealization of being famous. They said, they say, if I could just be famous, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd have it made. And you actually experienced high levels of fame mm -hmm. and maybe it wasn't all those cracked up to be. So can you just kind of share some of what that was like and maybe what you thought it was going to be mm -hmm. and then what it actually was? Sure. Um, I really embraced, um, I embraced it at the beginning, but it's not, that was not something that I really, when I would sit down and think about my goals and think about swimming and being an Olympic champion and all these things, being famous or what that meant 
-hmm. was not part of that picture. I didn't have illusions of money and fame and celebrity and all those things. I just wanted to be the best athlete in the world. And so I and there's was, a bit of irony there too, right? right? Like focusing on fame, you usually won't get it. Focusing on the goal sometimes. Anyway, just kind of a... Yep, for sure. And so I was surprised at some of the hmm. things that came along with it. Like I had death threats and wow. um, people would call my house and people called my high school and were threatening to kill me and these types of things. And so you start to learn really quick the underside of... Um, being in being in the public eye um and that's i mean most people would never even think to consider i wouldn't even think to consider that an olympian just for being a fast swimmer that you'd be getting death threats like, yeah why? i i mean i guess i'll never know yeah. but i think that there's there's um sick people everywhere right yeah. and whether they did it for a joke or whether they did those things for attention hmm. or if they were ever really serious i'll yeah. never know um, nothing ever happened. Nobody ever came to our home. Nobody ever stalked me at my school. So nothing ever really came from it. But it was the first, you know, that was really the beginning of me. Um, I'm kind of a introvert. Okay. And so having to be so extroverted all the time, um, I think. Sounds exhausting. <laughs> I think what happened to me as I aged was that I learned really young how to be what everyone thought I was Mm. and not really be who I authentically was. And that's where, as I got older things, I started to run into some trouble. Wow. So, so through that, you navigated high school trying to figure out who are my friends, who are the people who just want to name drop. Yeah. Um, And then what happened from there? I went away to college. I went to the university of Texas in Austin and we had an amazing swim program there and won multiple NC2A titles. And, um, and I had a wonderful, wonderful experience at the university of Texas. Um, you know, we kind of had a, we had a little bit of a mentality of we work hard and we play hard. So we worked real hard in the pool and outside of the pool. Um, but we also played hard, you know? And so I think that, um, I, in 1988, so after my sophomore year in college, we had Olympic trials in Austin and, um, which was my home pool at that point, I was still ranked number one in the world. There was no reason I wouldn't have been on that Olympic team. And I showed up at Olympic trials and I just kind of mentally fell apart and I did not make that Olympic team. Hmm. And that was really after that whole Olympic trials and they accumulated, accumulated the team on the side of the pool. And I was in the stands, you know, that was the first time I realized that I had never really had a plan B. Like Mm -hmm. nobody had ever sat down with me and said, if you don't make it, it's okay. And this is what happens next in your life. And so that was the first time that I actually remember drinking to not feel Hmm. was after I didn't make the Olympic team in 88. As a matter of fact, I probably held on to that for 25, 30 years. Um, that failure in my mind far and away exceeded the success I had had four years prior. Wow. And so, so then what happened from there? Well, you know, I, um, I really didn't start, you know, I, I met my husband and, got married and we had, you know, we were living on the West coast. We had two beautiful girls. And when the girls were quite little, um, is when I really, st- you know, drinking was a big part of our social life. So when we had our friends over, we were raising our kids with friends, you know, drinking was always a normal part of what we did. And it's mm-hmm. normal for many, many families. Um, but I think that pilot light for me, in my brain was always lit because of my genetic predisposition Mm -hmm. that I, I was probably are always destined to be an alcoholic. Interesting. So, um, you know, as our lifestyle promoted more drinking, I was losing more and more control of my, uh, of my ability to control the drinking. Um, not just the quantity, but the frequency, you know, we went from being the Friday, Saturday night drinking to then, Thursday nights, or maybe somebody would come over for dinner on a Sunday night and we'd have some wine. 
So I was drinking more often. And then obviously the progression for me was also quantity. You yeah. know, I start, I was able to start drinking more. That's just all part of the progression. Yeah. And was there a certain point where you noticed, wow, I think this is a problem or was it just kind of, it's just what you did and it was just like, no, it's just. Whatever. Yeah. I had an incident when my kids were quite young. Um, I, let me back up and say, sure. I think that I knew prior to the incident, I'll tell you about, I think I, in my soul, I think I knew I had a problem and people in my life were starting to express some concern mm -hmm. about my drinking, which unbeknownst to me until, you know, but of course now I know when that happens, that's when we really do need to start, start taking a serious look because we're not the greatest self assessors, you know, cause we're in it. And this is something that lives in the, in the pleasure center of our brain. So because we feel good and because it brings us joy and we feel like this renewed energy and we feel prettier and more attractive and more social, there's that part of you that can't quite also say this is not good for me. Mm -hmm. So the voices of others is really important. Yeah. So people started to express some concern. My husband, my close friends were, exp were expressing concern for my drinking. And I definitely was in complete denial. Hmm. You know, I thought I still had control of this thing that I was fine. And so, um, one night we were at a party down the street. So we had just walked there and the kids were home with a babysitter and I walked home in a blackout and put the kids in the car and drove the babysitter home and got in an accident. Hmm. Thankfully, nobody was hurt, but it terrified me. But it wasn't enough to get me sober. Hmm. And that's the thing I think a lot of people don't understand is that when these incidents happen for us, everyone thinks, well, this surely will be the thing that makes them stop drinking. Yeah. And that's not always the case. You know, some of us, some of us, our bottoms are higher mm -hmm. and some of us, our bottoms are lower. Yeah. And some of us, our bottoms are death. Right. Yeah. Because that's the ultimate bottom when it comes to addiction. Yeah. So the question is, where can we meet people at their bottom? Can we help raise their bottom to them so they don't have to keep going into the darkness? Yeah. Because there is there as long as we keep digging. We will. The bottom gets lower. Yeah. You know, in the. um I'm kind of surprised I'm, I'm sharing this, but I think just the, the shame surrounding addiction and the way it works. Um, when I was in middle school and high school, I had a pornography addiction mm -hmm. and it's, it's different, mm -hmm. but it's very similar. And you're sure. like, what am I doing? This is terrible. Like I totally against everything I believe in, but nothing was enough to make it stop as many times as I would tell myself, like I hated myself. I'm, you're never gonna do this again. Like all the, all the things, all the things it was all rooted in shame and it was never enough. And I mean, like you say in that time, like you recognize this is wrong. Like this is totally a problem, but it wasn't enough to change. And I think, um, I mean, we all experience addictions on some level, whether it's alcoholism, whether it's drugs, whether it's food, whether it's pornography, whether it's whatever it is, some are just more publicly damaging and some have a more widespread noticeable effect. But mm -hmm. I think the important thing to recognize is that the the hating yourself, the shaming yourself, the, all of that fuels it. I feel like maybe it feels like for a time mm -hmm. you can maybe by sheer will, willpower change. I mean, did you experience like all those same thoughts of, mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, shame is what nearly killed me. You mm -hmm. know, I went to, I went to four residential treatment programs in two years. You know, I, I was, I was away a lot. And I felt like a failure because I couldn't get it. You know, like I would go to treatment, I would do okay for a little while and then I'd be back drinking. And, you know, my relationships, I went through a divorce um, from my kid's dad. And, um, you know, by the time I checked into my last treatment center in February of 2012, um, I was really just a shell of the person that I once mm -hmm. was, you know, there was, it, I was really soulless, you know, my soul was very, very sick. And, um, you know, I almost died and I, I wasn't so, so sure I didn't want to die. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I detoxed at home alone, which is incredibly dangerous. You know, alcohol withdrawal is the only withdrawal you can die from. 
And, um, I made it, I need, I made a promise to myself that, that night when I said I'm done is that if I, if I survived detox at home alone, that I would try one more time and go to treatment. And five days later, I kind of came out of it and, um, and I got on a plane and I went to treatment for, you know, what I hoped to be my last time in 2012. And I stayed for 90 days and it was the greatest gift that I ever received. Um, willpower really has nothing to do with this. You know, the primary reason that people don't get help, you know, less than 10% of people that struggle with addiction ever receive help. The primary reason for that is not financial. It's Mm. shame Mm. because, you know, I was so wrapped up in being what everyone thought I was or what I should be that I was, and all along I was dying on the inside. Yeah. And so, you know, I was lucky I survived it. Many of us don't. Um, but, you know, treatment really, um, staying that long and getting the help that I needed, both mental health and substance use, co-occurring type of treatment, is really what helped me get into the starting blocks of life as a sober woman. And it also gave me the tools to continue and sustain recovery. It's not just about getting sober. Mm-hmm. It's about how to find sustained recovery. That's our challenge. Yeah. I mean, because you can go, I don't even know what, what the average length of time is between relapses, but if you think, oh, I'm good now, I'm sure that's probably a really dangerous point of when you... Yeah, Very dangerous. Yeah. And um, um, there's a saying that what you put in front of your recovery, you will lose. Hmm. And I proved that point by the end of my drinking, everything that I put in front of my recovery, I can't go to a meeting tonight. I have the girls, the girls have soccer practice. I need to get my work done. All those things that slowly started to take over the top of the list. I lost every single one of them. When I returned to drinking, I Mm -hmm. lost my career. I lost all my friendships. I lost my marriage and ultimately I lost my children. Hmm. You know, I had to walk into a courtroom at 95 days sober and have a judge tell me that if I, if all I had to do was stay sober for two years and I could have legal rights back to my kids. Hmm. And the reason I had my kids removed, not removed, we were separated. So my ex-husband took full custody. But the reason that the judge agreed to that was because not because I'd ever done anything terrible to them or with them, but because I tried to get sober too many times. Hmm. Which is... It's such a, that sucks. <laughs> is that, has that changed at all in the way the justice system works? That just seems so backwards. Um, or is it I still think that, that way? the justice system um, could do a much better job at under, I mean, if you look, I mean, this opens a whole new can of worms when sure. we start talking about this, but you know, if you look at the, the overcrowding jails and prison systems and how many people are in there for drug, um, for drug offenses that really need treatment Mm -hmm. and are getting nothing in jail and the taxpayer. I mean, we could, this is a a whole nother rabbit hole, but, um, something needs to be done. I mean, there needs to be better access to treatment, you know, Oregon sits at number three in the country for the rate of addiction in our state. And Mm -hmm. we rank 50th with regards to access to treatment. Wow. At least you're in a Holloman was sharing in the previous episode, um, about, (laughs) Just the, I think we're also ranked 50th in terms of mental health access. Sure. So both mental health access and treatment access, that's a pretty terrible combination. It's, it's, it's a, and as you see the condition of what's happening in Portland, you can see the devastation mm-hmm. by not having the resources that people really need. I, I was blessed because I had family that had resources to mm-hmm. get me the help that I needed. Yeah. Not everyone is as um, privileged as I was to have the access to the things that I had access to. Yeah. So sure, I mean, being being a mom, you ultimately had to make a choice that you had a good idea. Like this could, like you either continue down the path of alcoholism, try to make things work with your family, or go to treatment, knowing that you may lose your family. Did you know that was a choice you were making? I knew if I drank again that I would lose my kids, hmm. and I drank again. Yeah. 
I knew, but that's the power of the disease. That's not my moral failing because, you know, alcoholics and addicts are not usually not bad people, but we do bad things when we're under the influence. Mm -hmm. And so, um, there's a lot of judgment and, and stigma attached to when people run into situations like I did with losing my kids and, you know, you start you start racking up things in the loss column yeah. and people say, what the heck's wrong with her? Yeah. Why can't she just stop drinking? Yeah. Right. Instead of understanding the sickness and the disease and that my mind and brain was completely hijacked by the chemicals. You know, people say, you know, I can't tell you how many days I woke up and said, I will not drink tonight. I am convicted. I'm not drinking. And then by four o'clock, right. You, you start getting the itch. And that's actual real like brain chemistry stuff because your serotonin level dips, all the things start happening mm -hmm. and then you end up drinking again. Yeah. And because, you, and if you don't have the tools to know how not to yeah. by getting help, the cycle never ends. So what are some of those? And I don't know if there's still more to share on that or if you want to move into like some of the tools that do exist and like the treatment. Um, is there more to share? I don't want to jump too far ahead. Oh yeah. I mean, w and we can talk about the tools, you know, I just, one of the things I want to, I want to communicate most today is hope. Yeah. You know, as sad as our stories can be and as heartbreaking as our stories can be, there's also a lot of hope and there's, um, you know, I personally feel that this was all meant to happen in our life. And I say ours because my kids are involved too. And, um, you know, I also believe that our greatest opportunities for growth, um, and greatness come from our darkest times. Yeah. You know, it took me two years to be able to like actually brush my teeth and look at myself in the mirror. Um, after being sober correct. for two years, I wanted to dis. I like, I only wanted to be visible to my kids because I was so, so ashamed. Mm-hmm. And then at four years is when I first went public with my recovery because I finally made a decision that I'm not going to, I hid in my addiction. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to hide and be ashamed of being a woman in recovery. Yeah. And that's the day that I chose to start recovering out loud and to use my platform to start chipping away at stigma and also to give people some hope. Do you feel like when you did that, I'm sure that was a, terrifying decision at that one point where you was it a social media it was post? and so you did that what was going through your mind as you hit yeah that post button? it took me a, a while to hit the post button <laughs> the picture was a picture of my olympic gold medal next to my aa coin hmm. and i think i said something to the effect of the olympic gold medal is what i did and the AOA coin resembles who I am. Hmm. And I went on to talk some more and it took me a long time to hit post because yeah. I was really afraid of the um, negative comments what and were the some, stigma. What were some specific fears? Like what were the things you were afraid of people were going to say? I was afraid for my kids hmm. that they would um, get backlash from their friends or their friends' parents. Um so I, of course I talked to them before I ever posted it and they were very encouraging of me to do it. And they have remained encouraging of me to be um, public about my recovery ever since then. They're public about it too, as adults. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was afraid that people would say those stigmatizing things. Like I was called everything. Okay. Like when I was drinking, I was called a horrible mother, mm -hmm. a terrible woman, you should just, your kids would be better if you just disappeared, wow. you know, these types of things. And I was afraid of those kind of comments, Yeah. but I was the, the pride I felt as a recovering woman finally outweighed the fear of being judged. And that's when I was able to hit that post button. So what was the ultimate response? That it was that? like unreal positive. Not one negative comment, not one. I post every year on my birthday, my sobriety day. Wow. And it's the most engagement I ever receive on social media is on that day. Love, support, encouragement. Um, that first post, people were shocked 
people that don't live by me anymore. You know, I'm part of a global community on Mm -hmm. Facebook because of my swimming. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just, so people in my community knew because, you know, my fall from grace was not exactly um, private. Yeah. Um, And so it shocked a lot of people, but I think people are so starved for somebody to talk about it Mm -hmm. because I don't think I know one person that doesn't know somebody. Yeah. Do you feel, because when someone's an Olympian or they compete at at a certain level um, and experience a lot of success, that in many ways can become their identity. And then once that's gone, especially if they've grown up in an alcoholic Mm -hmm. household and sometimes, and sometimes maybe not, but when they've lost their identity, is that, can that be a trigger? Sure. Or did you find that when you came public with that, that other people that, whether they'd been a pro athlete or an Olympian themselves, Mm -hmm. that also came out and said, well, thank you so much because I also experienced that. Did you experience any of that? Very much. I still get messages from people Mm -hmm. that, you know, reach out to say like, I'm struggling and they ask for help. Yeah. Um, And it's my greatest pleasure and joy to be able to help somebody else. Yeah. Even just to be an ear. Like I don't need to make any recommendations, but I can tell them like, I understand absolutely everything that you're going through because I was there. Yeah. I lived exactly in your shoes, you know, and that it's powerful in addiction to not, to know that you're not alone because you do feel alone. Yeah. You know, growing up with, um, with a mother who was an alcoholic and also being one yourself, if you could go back and have a conversation with your mom, like if you could go back, basically be in that room with her while she was drinking, what would you say? Have you ever thought of that or is that, sorry, I just kind of sprung that. Yeah, on. no, it's a really, really, really good question. I think I would, I know for sure I would have a lot more empathy I know for sure I would talk to her much kinder than I did. Um, I know um, that I would have told her I loved her no matter what. Um, I would have done my best to understand as a 16-year-old child and younger what she was going through if I understood the disease. And and see, that's one of the calls to action Mm. is that If you have someone in your life, a grandmother, a grandfather, a parent, a sibling that has struggled with substance use disorder or any mental health disorders, you owe that. We owe that to the future generation to talk to them about it because I didn't understand the hereditary nature of addiction until I suffered myself. And so I think that if I had understood it more or it had been part of our, our conversation at home, but mm-hmm. we didn't talk about it. Yeah. There was too much shame back then. And yeah. especially for women. I mean, when, women didn't get help back then. You're talking about the early 80s. Mm-hmm. You know, women weren't even part of studies about addiction, yeah. about the brain and all these things. It was all men. Mm-hmm. So my mother never got the help she needed because it was easier to just close the front doors and we just don't talk about it. Yeah. You know, um, I've made what I like to say a living amends to my mom by making my apologies to her after she was gone because I didn't get sober until after she passed. Um, and I hope part of my living amends to my mom is that I've stopped the cycle in our family. I I hope I pray that for my girls that they don't suffer. You know, and you mentioned you felt like you were essentially destined to become that. No matter what, you would have been an alcoholic. Given the fact that it was a, your mom within you and now the next generation is kind of at the point where it's like, okay, here's where we need to make mm-hmm. sure this, this stops. What hope do you have that it will stop and that yeah. given their genetic predisposition that they'll be able to overcome it. And it wasn't just my mom and I, I mean, there's like generations of our family that have struggled. Um, my hope is that I've showed the girls that I've shown the girls, um, a different way to live. Mm. Um, my hope is that, um, they have a full understanding of what's running through their veins and that, um, awareness is key. Um, 
I, of course, uh, never want to have to see my kids struggle the way I struggled, but I also have to allow my children the grace of living their own story. Yeah. And I can't make my story theirs. Um, they're writing their own script and, um, I can, I can wish and pray that it doesn't happen to them, but it's not enough. As we talked about love, all of it's not enough. So my hope is awareness, um, that they've been exposed to my recovery now for 11 years and that, um, they understand what, what the genetic predisposition is to them as well. Yeah will hopefully play a role as they get older. Um, Because for women, especially with alcohol, typically happens a little later in our life, Mm -hmm. and it happens pretty fast. Mm. So um, that's my hope for them. Yeah. And do you feel, we mentioned just a little bit ago, that addiction takes many forms, Mm -hmm. whether it's alcoholism, whether it's it could be anything. Do you feel like there's a similar, like the addiction part, whether it's alcohol or anything else, do you feel like there's a similarity there? Obviously you experience alcoholism. Which is- oh yeah. I mean, it, it all lives in the same part of the brain, mm-hmm. right? It affects our pleasure center and that's your decision-making. All of that is affected by mm-hmm. any kind of addiction, yeah. even um, shopping or gambling or drugs and alcohol, um, food. You know, if you go into Barnes and Noble and look for, and you look for the addiction aisle and you, there's far more books on food than there is on, on substances. Mm. So it's all, it's about control, the illusion of control. Mm -hmm. And, and then the, the, you know, that the cat and mouse game of the feel good to not feel good to then feel good because you don't want to feel bad. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you get on that hamster wheel with anything that's addictive. Well, that is the end of part one, and I'm so sorry to do that to you, but we'll be coming out with part two next week. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to the Giving Time Podcast, and if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend who you think might benefit from hearing it. And while more and more people are continuing to hear about this podcast, I really need your help to spread the message about all the people and organizations that make Newberg so great. Well, thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you in the next episode.